set the pace when I'm running. I all Hello, everyone, and welcome here to another piece inside of the larger puzzle of the Pinstripe Preview here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Always proud to be here with you every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Eastern Time and ecstatic that Syracuse, my hometown, is not only in a bowl game, but close by in New York City and in a very special place, especially at this time of year between Christmas and New Year's. So with that being said, it is my honor and my privilege to welcome back to the show here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora, Syracuse Center alum, Mackie McPherson, the grandson of Coach Mack, one of the greatest people, not in Syracuse football history, but to touch Syracuse, New York, Central and Upstate New York itself, and of course, the football world as well. So with that being said, Mackie, how are you? Doing well, Dan. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely intro. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to go back to Grandpa. If he was here right now, what do you think Grandpa would be saying on game day? No, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, a, a bowl game is the best best time for anyone. And, you know, yeah. you go out there and enjoy it, play for the seniors, play for everyone who's in the stands. Your families are all here. This is what you did all the work in the summer for. So go out there and enjoy it. Knowing about the legacy for you and your family, for, for your grandfather, for Coach Mack, for yourself and for your brother Cam, to have that always etched in history, such a unique part of history to have brothers and a grandfather all connected to one program. When you reflect on that and you look back on that and knowing that not only will that be in Syracuse history, but it's going to be in a very small percentage of athletic history, just what that means to you and if you ever take the time to think about it. Yeah, you know, I don't think it's something that I would reflect on enough, but it is something that's interesting, especially when it's brought up like like you just did, Dan. You sit there and you think to yourself, you know, it's been almost 10 years since I've played my last Syracuse football game, which is pretty crazy to think about. Um, and I was talking with Cameron about that over the holidays. But, you know, you think about just sort of the, the way that our family has cemented ourselves into this community into Syracuse University and with the athletics program um, it really is just a very special thing for everyone in our family and and it's nice to be able to share those experiences with people within the community as well and like you said having a connection with this community and in your family cementing yourself into this community when you look at the fact that you know coming from Christian Brothers Academy and being recruited and have an opportunity at Syracuse. It's something that hasn't happened in a while. We've seen a lot of coaches since your grandfather and, and coach P Paul Pascaloni. It's been a long time. Greg Robinson didn't really do it. Doug a little bit, Scott, not so much Dino really not at all that we've seen until now with Sire Torrance. So keeping New York in New York, what that means to you and to look at the 2024 incoming class and seeing not only somebody staying in Syracuse from Syracuse, but having somebody like Sire Torrance from your alma mater, my alma mater of Christian Brothers Academy, even getting recruited by Syracuse, what that means to you. Yeah, well, I think, you know, a huge portion of that is is it's difficult to say what's happening behind the closed doors at Syracuse football right now, right? You know, it, they're competing and trying to navigate an ever-changing college football landscape that involves now the transfer portal, um, name, image, and likeness, and uh, trying to be a very competitive ACC school and something that we've seen them do this year. It's hard to make a bowl game, and it's hard to make a bowl game while playing in the most difficult part of the ACC. Um, so it is hard to say, you know, why aren't they recruiting the central New York talent? Well, you know, part of it is it's going to be hard to recruit Central New York talent because there's not as many players in this area as, say, uh, Texas, Florida. Um, or really the, the reason I'm saying all these things is because the way that recruiting has trended, especially in the past just five years, Dan, is it has become a national thing for every position. 
Yeah. Um, and, and so it's so challenging to recruit. Now, uh, in today's college football landscape, you yeah. throw in the transfer portal into that. And now it's really challenging. It's not like it used to be where you used to keep the homegrown talent at home because everyone can watch the film. Everyone can fly everywhere. Twitter exists. So you're not only competing against everyone in the country, but then everyone wants to have the same exposure as everyone else. So it's it's a really interesting amalgamation of, of things that are happening here at Syracuse University. So it's hard to say, you know, I wish that they recruited more people here, but it is extremely encouraging to see someone like Sayer, you know, like you said, someone who's a Syracuse kid, went to CBA, and is now committed to play for Dino Babers' staff at Syracuse. That's that's something I think the whole community can get behind. Yeah, you know, and, and we've seen other guys, you know, John Phillips on the offensive line go and play at Boston College. We've seen Servassier Dennis, who's going to take his shot in the NFL now, and he can say he's an ACC champion. He can say he's played in a New Year's Six ball. He can say that he's a captain, you know, playing for the Pitt Panthers, so let's do let's go to a guy like Servassier because I mean he changed his body. He was a quarterback and he became, you know, went from CBA, went to a prep school in New Jersey, became a linebacker's body, and then rose up the depth chart, became a starter. Then he's, I mean, even you see him like these last couple of years, he's playing, he's starting at linebacker and he's running out on special teams and making a massive play to pit them within their own five yard line to start a drive willing to go out there, do whatever he's asked to do, does it with a smile on his face, ex, you know, shows shows off his his education that he got at CBA, incredibly intelligent guy, funny guy, charismatic guy, off the field, awesome, on the field, explosive. What does it mean to you have a, have a guy that, you know, you and I can go to a CBA event, honor, you know, the history, and know that Servassier Dennis is a part of that? Yeah, it's, it's exciting. You know, that's the thing about this area, Dan, is, is – I think sometimes we notice the kids who, who leave here and we say, how come Syracuse didn't recruit them? And instead of celebrating and lifting up some of these kids that are from this area that end up going somewhere and making a name for themselves outside of the Syracuse bubble, um, which, you know, arguably could be more challenging depending on, you know, the way the public perceives you when you come into the, <laughs> come into the university. Um, so, you know, Servassier is, is a, fantastic story of perseverance and betting on yourself. I remember when he was playing quarterback and safety at CBA and he wasn't getting recruited by the schools that he wanted to be recruited by. And he took a shot on himself and went to a prep school. And when he went to that prep school, like you said, he worked his tail off and did everything he was supposed to do and ended up going to Pittsburgh. And now he's, you know, I don't know if there's an ACC school that wouldn't want him leading their defense. So that's a huge testament to someone like Servassier, who coming out of high school wasn't even being recruited. And, and that has as much to do with Servassier and the work he did after he graduated from CBA as it does for anyone recruiting or not recruiting him. Yeah, you know, and his his incredible job. I mean, what he's done and taking control of what he can control has really proven to be extremely effective as he steps forward here with Mackie McPherson in this pinstripe preview week we are on game day with Mackie McPherson Syracuse Center alum and of course grandson of the late and God bless him in heaven coach Mac and of the brother of Cam I, I I gotta I gotta ask you this because it's just it's important to me and it has nothing to do with the pinstripe but you and your brother had a nice photo shoot for Christmas. And I got to ask you about it and just what it's like, the personalities of your household. I got to meet your mom for the first time. And she actually, uh, she knows my dad and, you know, is, is out there, you know, fighting the good fight as, as my dad has done for so long. And my dad just retired and I got to meet your mom and tell her to her face, just how amazing I think you know, the kids that she's raised are, and just how great you are. I got to share the story with her that when you came into Carvel DeWitt and saw my grandmother, my mom's mom, they called G mama. And that she was sitting there in a wheelchair. And I was like, well, I'll take a picture. And she, she looked to one side and she goes, Oh, one, two. <laughs> and so, and I, I'll never forget, you know, that moment you were so sweet to her, told her to have a good day. 
And to her, the little things were everything. And she always taught me that. So, you know, I, I do want to one shout out your family. I got to shout out mom because I got to shout you guys out to her. And I want to know about the photo shoot with your brother. Well, that's a, I appreciate all the kind words. And, um, you know, I know that uh, that means a lot. And we think highly of your family too, Dan. Um, photo shoot's a funny thing. That was a uh, thing that was kind of birth of COVID. And we were all together for the first time Christmas of COVID. Yeah. And so we were all masked and, you know, something that we like to do as a family is we will dress nicely for Christmas Eve. Um, you know, nothing crazy, but, you know, we'll, we'll look good for Christmas dinner and, and Christmas Eve dinner and all that stuff that we try and do as a family. And uh, I can't remember if it was my sister or my brother, but they're, you know, both making comments of like, you know, we look really good. This is the opportunity for a photo shoot. So we went outside and we took a bunch of photos and it's kind of become like a mini tradition for all of the, you know, uh, young adults of the family to go out and take photos together. And it's actually become a really nice thing to have like kind of a, I don't know. I've, I don't know about you, Dan, but when it comes to being a, a 30 something year old male, I've, I don't really ever have my picture taken. <laughs> and so it's one of those things where it's like every year it's nice to have like some proof of life that you exist and it's not just you know like on a work site or something like that in the background so um it's sort of just kept up and it's been a fun little thing do you have a pose that is your like token go-to oh absolutely not no no <laughs> Does Cam have one or do, do any of Cam, you? Cam takes a power stance. He's okay. more of a, he's more of a, a commanding figure than I am, but that's to be expected. He's, he's a little more uh, comfortable with, with cameras and everything being a new house kid. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, having those family moments and, and having all of that time uh, over the years, and like you said, you know, talking about COVID these last couple of years should have taught us a lot. I tell people, if you didn't come out of this thing better than you went in, you probably need to reflect on what you're doing and, and try again. Your your mom, I do want to stick with her for a second here because she, to me, you know, getting to tell her about you guys and then getting to hear from your mom, Maureen, and, and just what, you know, just the type of human being she is. I would love for you to, to speak to that because I come from an incredible family and a great mom. And so I want to shout out Maureen because she's a trooper. She's a fighter. And I got to tell you, you look, ex you and Cam look exactly like your mom. Exactly. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. We hear that a lot. Um, it's, it's funny. So, so not just me and Cameron, but my little sister, Susie too, we yeah. all are like carbon copies of, of my mother. And it's and funny. To interrupt you, I do want to make a note here. I've never met Susie. So I'm speaking about you and, and Cam, as I've spent time around you, but Susie, right. don't take any offense. I don't want to be, I don't want to be cut out no. of the McPherson will. I'm sorry. So yeah. No, but you're fine. Very much like her. It's, yeah. it is. It's funny. We, my mom likes to say that she dominated the gene pool. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a fun joke, but it is really nice to, to hear those things about my mom. And, you know, she is a, a wonderful person. She's worked tirelessly for, you know, 30 years I've been alive and, uh, it's not like I was easy and it didn't get any easier once my brother and sister were born. And so she has been a tremendous role model, a tremendous person. And so I appreciate you kind of giving the platform to give her a shout out um, publicly, because I don't think, you know, when you get to be a little bit older and you see your parents get towards retirement age or you get you see your parents work towards, you know, something that isn't just being mom or being dad, you get a chance to actually shout them out. It's the right thing to do because you look back and think, wow, they really did put everything on the line for me. And, uh, you know, it, it's nice to be able to, in your own little ways, be able to lift them up. And, and, and going off of that, I just had my great uncle Carmen pass away 95 and a half years old. Wow. And incredible, incredible human being. And I think about the memories that I have. And I think about the things that, you know, I reflect upon with him and my, my great aunt Mary. So I know we talked a little bit about your grandfather. Everybody knew him as a coach, but when you think back on your grandfather, if you had him with you this Christmas, this new year's, 
what's something that she would have expected him to say? Like, what was he like as a grandfather? And what was he like to you? Because I've spent a lot of time reflecting on my great uncle Carmen and my family and just these, these things that made them the amazing people they are. So I'd love to reflect on, on grandpa, grandpa McPherson here and take it a step beyond being a coach. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've actually, uh, written about this in, um, in the newspaper as well, but it was something where I said, you know, coach Mac to everyone else, Papa to me. And that's very much how life was growing up. It was never, it wasn't until I was probably 14 when, you know, I really understood the gravity and the magnitude of college football. And I understood the gravity and the magnitude of who he is. He was and had been for the community for so many years that it really started to set in, which is a shame because you wish that you had understood all of that stuff when you were a kid, but at the same time, um, you know, you wonder if that would have jaded you slightly towards not seeing him as the loving and doting paternal grandfather figure that he actually, or a paternal figure that he was. Yeah. Um, and so to me, if, you, if while he was around this Christmas, it was always a fun joke. Whenever people would give him uh, clothing, he would always make some sort of, it was dependent on the piece of clothing, but if it was something with like bright colors or something like that, he, he honestly just couldn't help himself from saying something, be a smart ass. It would be like, you know, I remember one year he got this really smart looking yellow sweater and, uh, he held it up and he was looking at it. He said, Jesus, I could flag traffic down in this thing. Who the hell gave me this? (laughs) And, (laughs) you know, between like the one person who gave him the gift, I can't remember. I think it was my mom who was like slightly offended, but you had to laugh. You know, it was just one of those things where it, it was just hysterical. Um, and so it, that was always the thing with him. You know, you give him chocolate, you give him candy. That was the things he would look, most look forward to is, is a bag of peanut M&Ms that he'd hide underneath the bed because he thought people would steal it from him. <laughs> you know, those are the things that you remember. Um, and then obviously, you know, it's bowl season. So there's football on every day. I was watching football earlier um, when I came home from work and it's been a, a lovely thing to be able to, to see everything that's happening as, as we go through this bowl season and you, it's all you're going to talk about. Cause that's, what's on. You know, and, and the connection, the beautiful connection that I think, you know, there's, there's so, there's so much poetry in sports, in my opinion, and irony. And the poetry meeting irony is remembering the 1987 season where he elected to go for two to beat West Virginia in the dome. And then here's his grandson in 2012 playing West Virginia in a bowl game in the pinstripe bowl. And that connection for you, I mean, that rivalry, it's still there. Syracuse is four and oh in their last four games against West Virginia. And you're a part of that. So looking back on that and saying, okay, my grandfather coached against them and we're like, no, we're not tying. We're beating them and we're leaving this place with a victory. And then you taking it to West Virginia with your teammates. Just just what that means to you that the McPherson household has made it clear that not only is it a Syracuse rivalry, but you guys not too fond of them either. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where, especially when I was playing, West, there was two schools that we did not like as kids. It was West Virginia and it was Miami. And that was back when Miami was really good and uh, part of the Big East. Yeah. And I think that was something that came out in ACC Media Day in like 2013, where I can't remember. I think it might have been um, Sean Keeley might have wrote something where he said, you know, Mackie McPherson wants to remind you that you still hate Miami or something like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was just, you, you hear all the stories and it's not like we had hard feelings towards West Virginia as a, as a school. It was just their football program. My grandfather was good friends with Don Nealon, who was the longtime head coach of the Mountaineer program. Um, but it's, it's, it's different. You know, when you're playing for a trophy, you have that rivalry. West Virginia, I'm sure, doesn't feel similarly to Syracuse because they have their backyard brawl with Pitt. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I would say that was that was the big game that we had. And it is nice to say that I never lost to West Virginia in my four year career at Syracuse. That was a nice, uh, nice thing. 
did did grandpa have anything to say to that effect? I mean, did he lean into you and say, Hey, yeah, I want you to win every game, but you better beat West Virginia. No, he, it was never like that with him. He was always saying stuff, you know, go out there, play your best. It, 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 especially with him to me, he was very um, hands off as a football person. He approached everything, you know, Dan, when you were growing up playing football, and your grandfather would go to games if he was lucky enough to go watch you play. That's exactly the same way my grandfather treated me. And so I, that was something that I never took for granted. And I always appreciated was that it was never, you know, uh, Coach Mack domineering in the in the bleachers watching us practice. It was just Mackey's grandfather in the stands watching practice. And for some reason, all the high school coaches were nervous. You know, that's kind of how how it was in my brain. And he made sure to tell me that it had nothing to do with him uh, from high school, middle school, whatever, what have you, all the way up. Your road to Syracuse. I look back on these times and I, and I always, you know, I, I remember certain things. I remember stuff about, as I spoke with in, in our number one with Jerome Smith about Ryan Nassib and dispelling the rumor that he couldn't run. Cause I thought that was ridiculous. Or the fact that Eric Dungy wasn't a winner and he couldn't figure it out and whatever that may be, you know, to the Mackie McPherson, he's undersized. He's not big enough and he's not going to make it. And I laughed at that because after like one year, two years, three, I just, I was like, how many times does a guy have to run for a thousand yards? Like, what is, what does Mackie need to do? And so yeah. to me, you're one of those names that I will defend forever because I watched you. I respect you on the field. And I respect you more for the opportunities that you and I have off the field to get to know each other, be around each other. You know, I, I don't know if you know this. I don't care to tell the world this right now. I have no problem with doing that. But, you know, Mackie, I, I know we talk. I'd love to talk with you more than we do because I really do appreciate your time. I remember the last time I sat with Cam, I, I loved sitting with him. We were at Trappers and we just sat we did a show together. We were talking about his dreams and aspirations, and then he went and chased them. And I had no doubt that he was gonna. And I was kind of selfishly sad, like, okay, we're sitting here, we're talking about DC and all these things you want to do. And I got a really good feeling you're probably going to leave and do them, but I'm so happy for him. Yeah. You were one of those people, like I said, that I wanted to see succeed because I know what it's like to be a redheaded stepchild. I know what it's like to be told you can't do this. You won't do that. And you did it and you did it so well and you did it quietly. And no matter what you thought about what was being said, whether you knew it or not, you just went to work every day. So two things, I'd love for you to share your journey to Syracuse through your eyes. And I'd love to tell you once and for all, thank you for being a beacon of hope for a lot of us out there, including myself, that have to listen to the noise and realize that it means absolutely nothing if you don't let it mean anything. Oh, I appreciate that, Dan. Um, you know, obviously, it, it's never easy when you're not on top. And uh, that's the hardest part of life. And uh, I can tell you that right now, you know, there's, there's a summit for every person. Um, I thought when I was playing, I would never see that. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's one of those things where you you can go one of two ways when you hear people saying negative things about you, um, which I guess would lead pretty well into my, my Syracuse journey. Um, my Syracuse journey would, would have started my junior year. I was being recruited by Dan Conley, who was the uh, recruiting area coach for Section 3 at that time, and Doug Marone. Um, I had been in communication with them, but this is before Twitter and, and all that stuff. Um, so it wasn't like today's recruiting cycle. You, I sent in DVDs, for God's sake, you know. Um, so I sent in DVDs and my tapes and I would get letters back and it was all through the mail. I got the same sort of letters from Syracuse I did from other schools. It was Boston College and Syracuse and UCF and UConn and, um, you know, a little bit of stuff here and there. You know, Stanford, for some reason, called my mom instead of me. <laughs> um, but it all kind of came to a head when I went to, down to Boston to go visit Harvard because I had not received any scholarship offers and it was coming towards the end of my uh, um, junior school year. 
I'd already played through my junior year, had what I felt like was a, a very good season. My first, really my first real time ever playing center uh, and transferring over from linebacker and felt like I, you know, had a real shot to play high level college football. My whole goal was to play the highest level college football that I possibly could. And I had no interest in being a long snapper in college. I know everyone likes to say that I was recruited as a long snapper, but uh, I would like to dispel that rumor once and for all. Um, so I was being recruited by a few Ivy League schools. Really, the only school I was interested in Ivy League wise was Harvard, who was recruiting me um, aggressively. Uh, Coach Murphy who I believe is still the head coach at Harvard. Wonderful, wonderful person. Wonderful man. Um, it was the hardest conversation of my life telling him no. Um, but that we'll get to that point. So I went down to Harvard and I visited. And I got a call on that Sunday from Dan Conley, basically in a very hurried tone saying, what the hell are you doing in Boston? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't know if he thought that they thought I was at Boston College or if they just were trying to figure out what's going on. But I told him, well, coach, I got invited to this visit to Harvard. So me and my family, we came down, we enjoyed the weekend here. And, uh, you know, that that's what I'm doing. And so he said, well, Coach Marone wants to meet you at 10 a.m. on Monday morning in his office. Can you make that happen? And so, you know, I know uh, the people at CBA probably weren't too fond of this, but I pulled myself out of school at 930, drove over to Manly Fieldhouse, met my mom, and we walked in and Coach Marone uh, offered me a scholarship once I stepped into his office. Um, you know, this is part of the reason that I'll always defend Coach Marone. It in, is, uh, I was being recruited quite heavily to be a long snapper, but I had told most schools I was not interested in playing long snapper. I was, I was good in high school. I was very good at long snapping. There was no recruiting system at the time for long snappers, but um, I told schools I wasn't interested. I wanted to play center. That was the position I saw myself playing and competing for. And uh, so when I went into Coach Marone's office and he said, you know, I originally was going to offer you as a long snapper. Um, and then I put on your tape and I watched your tape and I watched it before you came in. And I think you have a legitimate shot of playing center here after watching it. And so basically, long story short, I told Coach Marone, I had no interest in coming to Syracuse as a favor. I had no interest in coming to Syracuse as a, a, a pity scholarship or a legacy scholarship. I wanted to come to Syracuse and compete for the starting center job at some point in my career. And Coach Marone, being a man of his word, said, look, I can't guarantee you anything. That's going to be up to you. What I'm telling you is I think you have the skill set that you could play center here if you worked your butt off. And so I committed to him that at that moment and then went back home and I think later that week I had my junior prom <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the rest is, is history in a way. Um, you know, my senior year in high school had a good year, was excited to get to Syracuse. But as we've talked about Dan, sometimes it was, uh, it was really challenging being, uh, a, an 18 year old Mackie McPherson walking on campus when, uh, there was not a lot of people fired up about my, my recruitment to Syracuse. Not a lot of people who were very happy to see that I was going to be playing for the Orange. And so, um, you know, it, it for the first year and a half, it was a, a real, real challenge. And, and, you know, when when you see that, I mean, you think, you know, why would somebody not be happy, right? Yeah. And can they just be supportive? And I always liken, and I, I say this all the time on the show, but I'll say it again. I always like in the world and just the world in general to a football stadium. And I tell people all the time, I say, okay, let's say that life is a football stadium. There's 70,000 fans in the stands and there's 22 people on the field. The 22 people on the field are the people who don't talk about their dreams. They go and live them yourself, me. And when you go out and you go after it, there's 70,000 people in the stand saying I'm better than Mackie at football. I'm better than Dan at broadcasting, running a company. But the reality of it all is you're watching and giving your thoughts while we're actually playing the game of life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the older I've gotten, the more I've realized two things outside noise by definition belongs outside. And the second part of it is if I'm in a stadium 
and I'm on the field, you can yell all you want, but I got to pay attention to what's going on on this field. And you have nothing to do with that field. Unless you want to come down here and play on this field and put the pads on in the game of life. I don't want to hear you talk about it. And just so the people know on the field and you had the same fight in you, I know you do. Whoever's in front of me, I'm not competing with you. I'm competing with Dan Tortora of yesterday. So if you think you're going to stop me, I find that hilarious because I'm trying to beat me and no one's going to be bigger than me about beating me. So, right. you know, I, I find it ridiculous that somebody wouldn't want to see you in Syracuse, orange and blue. And I'm yeah. happy that you were there and I'm happy that you played at Syracuse and you stood by your guns and Tim Murphy, like you said, still at Harvard, almost three decades now as the head coach. But for you, Mackie, I don't know always, it's not easy to deal with knowing that people don't want you to succeed. How did you deal with it? And how did you eventually learn to shut it off? Because in the world we live in today, people can tell you so many ways, so many avenues, so instantaneously, if they have a problem with you, if they don't like you, if they don't support you, when you and I were growing up, you got bullied at school. You left school at three o'clock. You didn't get bullied until tomorrow, maybe, or maybe they took a day off, whatever. But now on social media, you get bullied 24 seven. What advice would you give to people? And how did you eventually get to a point where you said, you know what? I just want to beat Mackie from yesterday. I don't care about what anybody else says in this stadium of life. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, I, I'd say it's funny, you know, what? 12 years ago, I'm 30 now, 12 years ago, I was 18 years old. I was looking online at, or maybe even 17 years old, looking at these articles that were coming out online about uh, my commitment to Syracuse. And I thought my first reaction was, I can't wait to see the reception that I'm going to receive because I'm really excited about this. And I hope other people are excited about this too. And the initial vitriol and very uh not really mixed response that uh, i received was surprising um and it was hurtful and it shook me but it was one of those things where once i got through the initial shock response then it was the onus was on me to say okay uh this is apparently not what everyone else wants that i thought but that's okay because this is the thing that i want to do um and so I'm going to put my head down and just work. And that was the same thing when I got to Syracuse and ended up as the third string center, which was expected as a true freshman, right? And then uh, I think two weeks into camp, ended up winning the second string center job and ended up beating out uh, a redshirt junior for the for this position. And there was a lot of grumbling in the locker room about, oh, you know, it's he's coach's pet or it's a favor to coach Mac type thing. Now at 30 years old, I can look back on, at that and say, as someone who has coached college football as a profession, that would be an asinine decision to just put a kid at the second string <laughs> position because it's a favor to your former coach. That would be absolutely insane. And yeah. that's a great way to get fired. But it's at 18 years old, 19 years old, you're thinking to yourself like, Oh my God, you know, maybe this is the case. And I had so much respect for Coach Marone and Coach Adkins and for Syracuse um, and for my family that I kept quiet throughout all of the things that I was hearing, both in and outside of the locker room. And especially after my freshman season, when Ryan Bartholomew, who was the starting center, graduated and the job was really up for grabs, but I was first in line. So it was really my job to lose is really how I interpreted it um, was to put my face into the weight room and to try and do everything I can to be the best player that I could potentially and possibly ever be. Um, I did not succeed in my first year of doing that because it was a, a multi-year project, but you know, I would like to think that as a, as much hate as I received my sophomore year, my first year starting, not everything was my fault. And, uh, um, I think people came around to that, especially as as the games went on. 
I can certainly look at everyone in the eye and say I was not the best center in the country my sophomore year first game against Wake Forest. Um, but I can look people in the eye and say that I improved every single week. And so that's the thing that I always set for myself as a goal. I never had illustrious dreams of being a first round draft pick. I had dreams of being the best player that I could possibly ever be and be okay with whatever the result was. And uh, so that's actually, that's why I feel at peace with the way that my football career ended. Um, you know, I, I think everyone who plays football, Jerome would probably tell you the same thing. He'll look at people who are playing in the NFL today and say, yeah, I think I might be better than that guy when I was playing. But, you know, you, you have to come at peace when you're done with your career, because if not, you can't keep chasing that dream. It's, it's not viable. It's not financially viable. It's not good enough for your body. And so, um, you know, looking back on that and saying, well, the reason I was cut from the Buffalo Bills is because I was told by the head coach that I just wasn't, didn't have long enough arms. Well, I can't control that. It wasn't like I was a bad football player. I just didn't have long enough arms and I can put my head on the pillow at night. Even that night, as bad as that feeling was the first time really in my life, I'd ever been told I wasn't good enough to play football for this specific place. Yeah. Um, you know, it was one of those times where I could put my head on the pillow because I said, okay, I gave this everything I had. I could not have done anything different. And it's not like I could just go back in time and make my arms six inches longer. So that's okay with me. Matthew McPherson, Syracuse Center alum, Christian Brothers Academy alum, and Syracuse native here with us on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora in the pinstripe preview for the pinstripe bowl week here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Mackie, what advice would you give people that struggle in this moment that are watching and listening, saying, I care way too much what people think, I'm living in the past, I'm not living for myself? What would you say to those people? Uh, first off, that's okay. That's not a problem. Um, second off, you have to be able to control the things that you control. And the things that you can't control, you have to accept the fact that you can't control them. Because... In the same ways, I can harken back to any life experience, and I'll stick with my college football experiences. Um, you know, I couldn't control the fact that I was born and raised, and I'm six foot two. That is that is what I was given, and I'm happy about that. That I'm six foot two, um, and my brother will look at you and tell you that I'm six foot one, but I'm not gonna. I'm gonna push back on that. <laughs> um, but you know, I am who I am. And so I, I'm, I can't change that. And so in the same ways that if someone is feeling like they're being doubted or someone is feeling like they aren't given a fair shot, you can't control what other people's opinions of you are. You can't control whether people like you or not. You know, your job is to be yourself. Your job is to be the best version of yourself that you could possibly be every day. And if you can show up and just do the things to be your best self, you're doing everything right. Now, if you show up and you make excuses for yourself and you're saying, why don't people like me? Or I'm trying really hard, but no one wants to, you know, no one wants to be a part of the thing that I'm creating or whatever that thing is, right? All you can do is say, I'm going to be the best Dan Tortora that I can possibly be. And if I fail being the best Dan Tortora I can possibly be, then, okay, at least I was the best version of myself and that that version failed in the same way that, you know, I showed up to the Buffalo Bills and was, you know, felt like the smallest person in the in the building when I walked through because I was walked in and I watched Mario Williams bench pressing 405 on an incline for sets of 12. And I thought to myself, holy crap, this is the NFL all right. And, you know, you go out and you give it your best shot. I can confidently say, I don't feel like I failed. I felt like I did everything I could in my power in the NFL. I felt like I did everything I could in my power in college football. I, I feel like I truly maximized everything I could have been. And that's why I don't look back on my career and think a bunch of what ifs or why don't people like me? I'm sure there are people who still don't think I was a very good player at Syracuse and that's okay um, because their opinion can't affect me because I know that I did everything in my power to be the best version of me. And so as long as I can say that about me, because I'm the only person that I can control, 
then I can put my head on the pillow. And I love that answer. And I can't even say this word because it makes me sick to my stomach. So I can't even say it. It's hard for me to spell it. But the Q-U-I-T word, I believe you can't fail unless you Q-U-I-T. I don't believe I failed at anything in my life. Because to me, it's always been, I have worked, I, I don't Q-U-I-T. I work to the best of my ability. And when I realize that an avenue has become a dead end, I'm not going to just keep driving and see the signs and say, you know, God's right and stop dead end. Don't pass here. And I'm just going to fly off the mountain. So, you know, I think, I think I could have learned sooner the roads that were dead ends, but beyond learning those things and, and, and obviously adversity that comes, I don't believe that I've ever failed because when I started my business, 10 years ago, 10 years and some change, 10 years this past July, you know, it's like, well, why would you leave ESPN radio? Why would you not want to go here? Why would you not want to be on Sports Center? Why would you leave traditional radio? And I heard that for two years. And I said, well, I was getting paid $8 an hour. I made $30,000 and I was given a check at the end of the year for $3,100 for the entire year. Like I could have bought food stamps. And I had bosses that continuously lied to me, broke promises and never let me be who I wanted to be. I said, I've done everything to expand. Now we like you where you are. And I was working in a, in a poor environment, negative environment, an anti-God environment in ways. And I just said to myself at 26, why am I going to keep, and I'm going to credit the person I was dating at the time too. She said, why are you working for people that don't respect you? don't know who you are, don't appreciate who you are. And I started my company at 26. And I'm not kidding about this, Maggie. I had 27 cents in my pocket. And I had $103 in my bank account. I was living with my mom's mom taking care of her after she had fallen. So I was taking care of my G mama, best person I've ever known. So I started my business, I went to clients that I was working with. And I said, Listen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure it out. And I looked at God and I said, there's air in front, like literally we're going to take the air in front of me and we're going to mold it into something. We're going to take the invisible and we're going to turn it into something we can hold on to. We could touch, we could look at, we could fix. And we got in the trenches and I said to God, we're going to do it. I never doubted myself in my ability. And I went out there and I tried and I worked and I had a lot of people uh, you know, that, that believed in it. And there was a lot of people that, oh, you know, he's a fraud. It's not real radio. We can't do it this way. Why would you go on the internet? Podcasting is ridiculous. And, you know, you heard all these things. And the funniest thing was finding out the people that were trying to discredit and dismember my business were actually taking the blueprint of my business and trying to copy it and trying to do the same thing. And I found it hilarious that the people that told you that you were a fraud and you weren't real were trying to be you. And I was like, why would you be me if I'm not a real company? And I just got to a point in my life where I said, and I had to say it over and over, but it was, you can take the blueprint to the car. You can build the exact car that I built, but you're missing one key component that you can't replicate. You don't have the driver. and it was a really long time and a hard time because I am a lover of, of all and I want to help people. And I try to be everybody's friend. I try to be good to people, even the worst people that I've met. And I think the hardest thing was realizing, like you were talking about, not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to support you. Not everybody wants you to succeed. And you don't know why. And it doesn't make sense. And I'm nice to everybody. I, I had a cousin tell me that this week. He goes, you've never been mean to anybody. Like, you're always nice to people. You're always good to people. And I said, well, what's the point of being mean? And I just got to a point in my life where I said to myself, you know what? I got relatives that are passing away. I got a grandmother that was my beacon of light. And when she passed, I said, you know, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep wasting time on other people's opinions. Mm -hmm. And I just dedicated to it 10 years in the business now, 19 plus years of broadcasting. And 
every time somebody tried to make me fail, I succeeded more. So I right. think God's already said to me like, Hey, you know, let them come at you. Let them throw you in the fire. I'm going to make you like the Hulk and you're going to get bigger. And all I can tell people out there is Mackie and I are a hundred percent of the screen that you're watching right now. We're told that we couldn't and we did. And Mackie did it in such a tremendous way, in such a great way. And I remember saying at the end of your career, I was, I stood, I forget who I was, I was just standing in a room and I go, yeah, but he's too short. Right. And I just, I just remember being like, I'm so proud of you. And yeah. you know, man, I, I, I'm just grateful that there's people out there like yourself that haven't quit. And as hard as it gets, because we're all human beings and we don't like negative actions and negative words and people just being mean, especially in today's society where it seems so easy, but you never gave up. And no matter how hard your days were, and I'm sure they were hard at times, I want to thank you for sticking around and sticking it out because I'm happy to know you. And, and, and I hope you know that. I appreciate it, Dan. And, and likewise to you, I remember when things first started off for you. And so, um, you know, there, you're one of the few people who's uh, probably still around that can remember uh, Jason Emmerich and I actually talked recently and he was talking about, uh, you know, you didn't miss a media opportunity for four years. And uh, it's not by choice, I'll let you know. By by year three, I was kind of sick of answering questions, but um, you know, it's one of those things where you go out and you do it. And um, so, everyone who covers Syracuse football, I feel like I I know. And I remember when you first started. So you started showing up and and uh, asking questions and recording and and everything. So it's cool to watch your career progress. And and uh, God can only hope that you're making more than eight dollars an hour now, Dan. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was told a long time ago because I'm not a fan of money. I, I was I was told by Dominique Rhodes, who had won a Super Bowl with with Peyton Manning with the Colts. We were I was covering his team, US U, the UFL team, United Football League. And again, it was like, well, why are you doing this? Nobody cares. And I was like, well, I care. These guys are out here working their butts off. I want to cover them. Why not? And I met one of my best friends from that. And I'm a I'm a uncle to his kids because of covering this team. Yep. And Dominique was with me one day and I was like, Dominique, I don't get it. I was like, I see like mean people succeed. People are so hateful. I try to do things the right way. I believe in God. I work hard. I have morals and values. Like what is going on? I'm, so, I'm like, I felt like I was just like at my wits end. And he looked at me and he goes, when are you going to stop worrying? And he, I never forgot. He went, if you chase the money, you'll chase it forever. But if you chase your dreams, I promise you, they're going to run up and catch you. That money's going to catch you. He said, you chase your dreams, the money will catch up with you. And I look forward to seeing that happen. And I never forgot that Dominique said that to me. And I think I still have his, his message on my phone when he first called. But it was just that, like, if I'm doing the right thing, why am I seeing so much hate? Mm -hmm. And then you think about it, and I know people believe what they want to believe, but this is a way to really come down to earth very quickly. A perfect human being built in the image and likeness of God to embody God and be on this planet in the form of Jesus Christ was stoned, thorns put on his head, spit at, sworn at, yelled at. They released a murderer in his place, and then they nailed him to a cross and let him bake in the sun until he died. So when I'm sitting here going, why are people being mean to a nice person? Well, why did they kill the guy that you wear across your chest? Right. And I think that that, that brings a lot of reality to me and humbles me that the best of us was treated like the worst of us. And how you're treated doesn't really have anything to do with you. It has more to do with the person that's treating you that way. That's the big thing. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying, Dan, is just controlling what you can control. It's a lot easier to be a bad person. It is a, it is a very easy choice to, to be unpleasant, to be bad, to make decisions that hurt others than it is to make the, the quote unquote right decision. The more just decision, the more, you know, it, there's a thousand ways that you can be an asshole. There's 
two ways to be a good person in any given situation. And so statistically, people are going to end up being, um, you know, it, it, we as a species are going to trend towards doing easier things. Um, you know, I am not perfect. I recognize that I do a lot of easier things in my life. Um, you know, do I, you know, be on my phone sometimes when I'm at work? Yeah, because that's the easy thing. And I'm not afraid to admit that. But at the same time, when push comes to shove and it's time to do something, are you going to show up? Are you going to do the things that are hard when the, you know, when you have to show up and do those things? You know, that doesn't change whether it's playing center for Syracuse or being a project manager for Syracuse, which is what I do now. And so to me, those are the things that I think you can take into life, not just into sport, um, and apply them directly to get the most out of life and to do the most with what you've been given. That coming here from Mackie McPherson, speaking about life, and it's not easy, but it's worth it. Here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios. Mackie, I, I want to thank you for all of the really deep and heartfelt conversation that we have had. Now I want to talk with you about hitting people and pancaking them. So in 2010, you came in as a freshman, first pinstripe bowl for Syracuse. And in 2012, you know, you've obviously risen up the ranks and, you know, the second pinstripe bowl for Syracuse. It's been 10 years since Syracuse went to a pinstripe bowl. 10 year anniversary, very fittingly, Syracuse is back here today in just a little bit at 2 p.m. Eastern time. They will be back in Yankee Stadium. You experienced both as as Jerome would would describe it as a youngling and as you as you, you know, grew up and whatnot in this game and, and as a person overall. So I'd love for you to paint the picture of your first experience in 2010 of the pinstripe bowl. And then your experience in 2012 beating Kansas state, West Virginia, respectively. And it was extremely cold both days. I was there for both. It snowed. And all I can tell you guys is I felt your pain in the sense of the fact that the press box, only one I've ever been in, and I'm not complaining. I'm just stating a fact had no enclosure so i was really cold and i was like why am i cold and i went like this to the press box and put my hand out and i was like you got to be kidding me so i was typing glove back on type again glove back on so i'd love to get your thoughts from on the field if it was any warmer down there in 2010 and 2012 uh no short <laughs> answer no um colder because the wind howls onto the field at Yankee stadium. That's one of the interesting things about, you know, you'd think a baseball stadium, they want to try and kill the wind, but you know, I'm, so I'm not a Yankee fan. I'm actually was born and raised a Red Sox fan. And so when they built that new stadium and everything pushes to right field, they are not kidding. Everything pushes to that corner. So the wind just whips. Um, 2010, I was the starting field goal snapper in the backup center. So I was very much so locked into the game. And, you know, we had a package where I had to go in at center because Ryan Bartholomew, the starting center at the time, uh, struggled with shotgun snaps, something he just couldn't couldn't do. Yeah. And uh, so I would win, I would go in during our shotgun packages and snap the ball really third and five plus. So I was very in tune with the game. And so I don't look back on that as uh, as someone who, like, wasn't playing. I, I was. Uh, I, I had a bit of a direct impact on the game because I had a really bad snap to uh, Rob Long um, that actually ended up becoming a missed PAT, I believe. Um, I think I had such a bad snap that it caused us to, yeah, have a missed PAT try. And so we were going back and forth, and that's where that two-point conversion at the very end of the game where the uh, – so the – the Kansas State player, I can't remember who, scored a touchdown, saluted to the, to the, I believe it was the ROTC that was in the corner yeah. of the stadium and got flagged 15 yards, which was the most glorious 15-yard penalty for me, the person who was about to cause us, um, you know, a, a real nerve-wracking moment. Um, so Kansas State was going to go for two to, I believe, 
it was to take the lead, if I'm not mistaken, because they scored with very little time left. And what again, um, it would have been to tie the game. It was Adrian Hilburn that had caught the pass from Carson Kaufman, and then you were up 36 to 34 with 113 mm-hmm. to go. Yeah, so it would have been to tie the game, yeah. the two point conversion. So they uh, they had to move 15 yards back on the try, and any coach will tell you there's no good play for for one play in in something over 15 yards, especially in the red zone where everything is so condensed. Yeah. So um, they were unsuccessful in their attempt, and then we end up winning the game. Uh, so I was very very happy about that. Freezing cold. Uh, as a long snapper, there is no good way to snap a football when it is like a rock. And so I have nothing but respect for anyone who is a long snapper, especially in the NFL, because those are even more difficult to snap Um, in Buffalo, New England, um, cold weather area, Chicago, unbelievably hard. So um, nothing but respect for that. Uh, 2012 was different. 2012 is a, a very different year in general. We, Obviously, we didn't start off the season extremely well. We went two and four. Um, Justin was out. Justin Pugh was out for the first, I believe, four or five games. And then he came back. He had a labrum surgery through spring ball, missed most of spring ball, and uh, came back, I believe, week five. Um, and we ended up kind of catching fire once Justin came back. We, you know, I don't want to say it was the offensive line or it may not even been Justin, but there certainly was an impact there. Having him at left tackle, Sean Hickey at right tackle, um, really cemented our offensive line to allow Ryan to build the relationship with players like Marcus and Alec Lemon. Um, And the thing just kind of grew legs and took off. By the time we beat um, Temple to get co-share of the Big East Championship, we truly felt like we could beat anybody. We felt like we were playing our best football. We were extremely confident. We were extremely confident in who was commanding the ship in terms of, of, of Ryan. We knew that he would take us to anywhere we needed to go. We believed in the system. um, And the coaches believed in the system. Nate Hackett had everything going on all cylinders for us. And coach Marone had completely changed the mood of the locker room from, from the year previous where we ended up losing a ton of games. It was a horrible year um, at the end of the season. So we had put everything bad behind us, and we felt like we were playing our best football. And so we got into uh, game planning for West Virginia, and we were looking at the uh, defense they were running, recognizing that we had not ever lost to them. Um, And they were still running that same defense. And we were fired up about that because we had their number on that defense. We knew exactly what they were going to do. Our coaches did an unbelievable job. As soon as the very first play went, um, I think it was like like a four or five yard run. As soon as that first play went and we got on the sidelines after that first drive, we looked at each other and we're like, okay, we've got their number defensively. We know exactly what they're going to do. Um, the only unfortunate thing about that game for us offensively was I could not feel my toes at halftime because of the amount of snow that was falling. <laughs> so it was cold, man. But, you know, we we had their number. We knew exactly what they were going to do. And if you go back and watch the tape, um, you know, you you could you can see it. And it wasn't just us offensive line-wise. The coaches had their number. The Ryan was on fire. And I don't know how you play quarterback in that weather. Yeah, I, there's There's no good way to play quarterback in that weather. But he managed to – to manage, he managed to keep the game where it needed to be. And then obviously, I don't need to tell you what happened with Jerome and Tyson. I mean, I, I don't even know how many yards we rushed for. I think it was 250 yards rushing, might have been more. But it was just a it was a clinic on running the ball against the 335 stack and the things that we pretty much spent all year perfecting. It was the perfect storm for us. Uh, that was by far and away some of the most fun football experiences I've ever had in my life was in that pinstripe bowl. And you having the experience of the running backs you had behind you, like you said, Jerome Smith, Prince Tyson, Gully, Antoine Bailey, Adonis Amin Moore, and so on and so forth. How, how was it for you? And did you feel the love and respect for them? Cause I spoke with Jerome about 
when he was honored and he, you know, had achieved, it might've been when he achieved his thousand yards in 2012 and he had all you guys come up. And I, and I remember the press conference is, you know, the media as a whole wanted to talk to Jerome and Jerome walks up there and you guys came up stone face, stood behind him. He's straight face standing in the middle of you all. And he wanted you up there because he didn't do it without you. He did it with you. And he wanted to give you guys credit. You guys look like his bodyguards. I love that. I will never forget that moment. What did it mean to you that Jerome was like, yeah, they want to talk to me, but you're coming up here because I didn't do it without you. Well, you know, that's what you do it for. It, it, offensive line is not about um, pageantry. It's not about followers. It's not about fame. Um, you know, but, I think the only reason people know who I am in terms of like recognition is because I had media literally every day that media was available for football players from the time I stepped on campus until the day that I walked off campus. And so I was on camera and that is just something that happens. You're on TV enough, you're on camera enough, people are going to end up recognizing you. Um, but I think if, you know, if Sean Hickey was to show up at the game on the sidelines, I'd be surprised if a majority of people knew who he was. And that's no offense to Sean. Sean is a fantastic football player, was a fantastic football player, and now very successful um, in what he does now. But yeah. it's it's not what it's about. And so when, when like, Antoine brought us up there, I remember he had a fumble in 2011 that ended up costing us the game. Um, and media was asking to interview him. We went up and stood behind him as a show of support because it, you know, the reason he fumbled the ball was because our backside guard didn't cut off the three technique. who got his hand out and punched the ball out. You know, it, it's, it's an 11 person game. And so when that's recognized and, and especially with running backs, because the relationship you had with running backs is, is a direct correlation experience. You know, you're, if the offensive line's bad, the running back's not going to have a good time. And, uh, so it's nice to know and, and to be recognized seeing that, you know, yeah, the stuff you do does matter, but is it something that we expect? No, because that's our job. And that's the way that we have to approach it because if it's all about the prima donna stuff, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. Jerome told me that sometimes he paid for food and sometimes he didn't have to pay and, and he could pay for himself what was when you guys went out to dinner did the running backs pay did the offensive linemen pay was it like you guys are paying this week because i feel like y'all can consume some food there and you have to so when you're out there playing the game so i i want to know what dinner bills were like with the we i mean it was, you got to remember we were college kids before name image and likeness yeah um so we we tried to find the deals um, usually you pay for yourself. I yeah. mean, that was, that was typically it first game of the year. Um, first game of the year, I think the running backs paid for us last game of the year. Cause we got over a thousand yards. I think they paid for us again. Okay. Um, never expected, always a surprise, always a good surprise, but you know, you're talking about a 20 spot back then. That was, that was a that's big time money. You know, we go to Delmonico's over on, uh, or no, sorry, Dominic's. We go to Dominic's on the boulevard, just off the boulevard there. And uh, I think the special was on Thursdays. They'd have like a big steak with a potato and steamed vegetables. And I think it was like sixteen ninety nine, And that was like, like the Mecca of, of deals that you could have at that time. So, you know, we'd all go have a steak, potato, sit down. The, the thing was about being together. And so it was always, you know, that was the most important thing. I have to ask this because I told him this. I've said it to Jerome. Some of your teammates have said it before I could even get it out of my mouth. And I think Kroom was definitely one of them that said it. But AD, Adonis Amin Moore, to me, was not utilized enough. I feel like in the history of Syracuse football, he was one of the untapped resources would you agree or disagree with me? I mean, you're an offensive lineman, so you spent time with him there and know what he could do in the backfield. I just feel like we didn't get to see everything that he had to offer. And it's no knock to any of the coaches. 
it's just my overall feeling because I love the coaches and I love the players. I, I just feel like we should have saw more of Adonis. And I think the statute of limitations is over. So you can answer this question. <laughs> um, boy, I'll tell you, he, you got to really look back and think very, very talented kid and really good kid too. But man, how Jerome, so you got Antoine, you got Jerome, you got Tyson, you got AD. How many running backs are you going to play with in a game? Yeah. You know, that's the hard thing. And so it, you could say that about a lot of people. You could say that about, you know, Ashton Broyles, the, the what could have been the, um, you know, I, I don't know if there was a better athlete I've seen than Ashton. And it's just, where do you put someone like that? Yeah. And sometimes in college football, especially, it's about fitting a scheme and it's about being the guy who can either understand the offense best or the guy who can fit the scheme best. And, you know, the coaches are there to, to put the players who are going to put everyone in the position to win. Um, you know, you look back on the history books and you're not going to say, well, Adana should have played over Jerome. Or Adonis should have played over Tyson. But then you look back and you say, man, Adonis was a really good athlete. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so you're sitting there and you're like, well, how, how do you have him go over this guy or this guy? I think it's a testament to Coach Wheatley's recruiting of talk about an unbelievable job of getting so much talent in one room at one time. Yeah. Um, you know, the, to me, that's the thing. In college football, just same with – NFL football, there's going to be people who are going to be the odd people out. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality of life. And it's nothing to do with Adonis not being good enough. It's nothing to do with Jerome or Tyson, uh, you know, beating him out and, and making him an inferior player. I think it just has to do with the way that things shook out for AD compared to the way that things shook out for Jerome and Tyson we could be talking about this in another reality where Jerome was the odd person out. Yeah. And then AD is the person who's up on the podium with us behind him. And so it's one of those things where it's really hard to say. The other thing as well that I would like to say is AD handled anything and everything with the utmost class and respect for the program because it is hard not to play. I mean, it, I played – a lot of football in my day and even as a freshman i didn't like not playing it's hard not to it's hard not to play the amount that you want to play and unless you are the guy you're not going to get those minutes and it is it is a really tough position to be put in um whether he was used enough or not i i don't know i'm just a center it's hard for me to say <laughs> i was happy i was happy when i did my job and the person i was blocking for didn't run up my backside that was the thing I was happy about. So it was, it's, I, it's hard to have an opinion on that, but I will say like, I love the kid yeah. and I thought he was really, really talented, but I loved every guy in that backfield. And then, you know, the guys who came in after AD were also really good. So it's hard to say, you know, he got screwed because of this or he didn't because of that for me, but I understand where Eric's coming from. Uh, coming here from Mackie McPherson. Mackie, pinstripe preview week. You were at both pinstripe bowls, had a place on the field in both 2010, 2012. Unprecedented three times. Syracuse will now be there as they kick off today at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And if they win, unprecedented three-time winner of the pinstripe bowl they could be, which is on the line. Your message to the gentleman on the field here in 2022, what do you want to say to your Syracuse brothers as they line up in their pinstripe bowl? You know, if I had the opportunity to talk with the guys, I would probably say something along the lines of what I told you earlier, Dan. Um, you know, this is this is what you work all year for. You work all year. I'm not talking about the football season. I'm talking about starting in January, February, when you get up at 6 a.m. This is the thing that you work for all year, is to show up in opportunities like this, play against quality opposition and to go out there and prove just how good you are to the rest of the country. And this is for pride. This is for honor for the school, honor for yourself, the name on the back of your Jersey, but it's also for fun. 
And don't forget that. So when you go out there, the name of the game is to win, but make sure you have fun when you're doing it because you never know when the last time you're going to get a chance to do this is. Don't ever take it for granted. And really appreciate the fact that you are sitting in an unbelievable venue, taking part in something that has so much history for this university and have an opportunity to cement your names in a legacy that is going to be revered years down the line. People will talk about the 2022 Pinstripe Bowl team as another team that won a bowl game. In the same way that we're talking about 2010 and 2012 and the other teams that have won bowl games that I've been a part of or other people have been a part of. So to me, that's the that's the message that I would pass along is to understand the gravity of the situation and to respect it and then go out and have fun because this is you don't do all the hard work. You don't do all the stuff that sucks during the year just to get to a pile of garbage at the end. That's not worth it. So enjoy it. Yeah, Colin here from Mackie McPherson, Syracuse Center alum, Christian Brothers Academy alum, and of course, a native here of Syracuse in central and upstate New York. On Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora's Pinstripe Preview Week inside of the Cafe Kubal Studios as we get set for kickoff in Syracuse's historic third Pinstripe Bowl. Mackie, thank you so much today for a conversation that truly embodied everything about what Wake Up Call stands for, which is our tagline where sports meets life. You made that more real than anything I could ask for. So thank you for the life lessons in the world of sports and beyond. And, you know, thank you for everything that that you've done for me. And thank you for your kind words. You a little bit goes a long way, like I said about my grandmother and, and giving me that. So thank you for everything, truly. And I And that's an understatement. I appreciate it, Dan. Likewise, likewise, it's nice to be in uh, in Syracuse and spending time with people who who know what it's all about.